Hi, this is Pete Jones from Tiger Moth Tales, and you're listening to Sonic Perspectives. Hey, everyone. Welcome. This is Scott Medina with Sonic Perspectives. Yes, we have Pete Jones on the line from Colorado to sunny old England. Well, maybe not so sunny right now, right? <laughs> it's uh, on and off, on and off. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Well, good to have you here uh, with us, Pete. It's really nice. Hey, it's great to be here. Yeah, we're all there. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, chatted about oh, half a year ago about your vocals on the uh, new Cyan album, or, or new old album, I should say. And now thrilled to have you back uh, for the Tiger Moth Tales album. It's just... Uh, just about to be released probably just shortly after this interview airs and um really, really looking forward to talking with you about this one but but first of all you know a lot of our listeners for those who aren't familiar with you yet i thought it would be helpful to kind of give a, a little trip down memory lane if you could let us know kind of where you've come from what's brought you up to the place you are today uh well, where to start um <laughs> i I, well, I've always I've always been involved with music ever since I was a young lad. It's the only thing I've ever really been any good at. Um, so, so I thought you you know you might as well uh, go for it. Um, so yeah, I, I started. Well, let, let's sort of cut to um, when I left school and I was fairly determined to be uh, to somewhere in the industry. And I tried for several years to cultivate some sort of success with. A pop or adult contemporary, as you might say, mm -hmm. uh, that that failed dismally. But I, I had a lot of good times trying to do it. Um, but it, but in, and that included an appearance on the on the first series, the UK series of the X Factor, which which is all I'll say about that because it's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> there, was some, there were some good times, and um, yes, yeah, so sometime around two thousand and twelve, I guess it would have been or eleven. I started to become very disillusioned with the industry as a whole, uh, um, or perhaps I just got really bitter about the fact that I couldn't get into it, <laughs> one, one, one or the other. Uh, but you know, it seemed to me like uh, pop was going down a, a, a route that I wasn't interested in, and that I was also far too old uh, now to be to have a chance of succeeding in. And the, the music that was being created wasn't, you know, I couldn't see much vision in it. And, um, and around that time, I got tremendous writer's block. I just sort of lost interest in the whole thing. I didn't go in the studio for about two years. I didn't write a song. And it was, um, well, a bit of a dark time. Although I suppose I concentrated on other aspects of, uh, of performing and stuff, which I was still doing. And I don't quite remember when I got the idea, but I started to to sit down and write a few songs. I just thought, let's get a tape recorder running. So that's retro. I got this cassette player running and thought, let's just, just, let's just write whatever occurs to me to write. And around that time, I'd recently got into uh, Big Big Train, Frost, Agents of Mercy. I just basically discovered that modern prog was a thing. And up until then, I just thought it was people like Steve Hackett and yes, it's still sort of, you know, carrying the torch, but that prog would inevitably die the death, you know, um, just over the course of time. So I, I discovered all these amazing bands and, and, and basically that the whole scene had been, well, it had never stopped really. So I had a lot of catching up to do. And so my listening habits changed quite significantly. So when I sat down to write these songs, I, I found myself going in a distinctly prog direction, of course, always keeping in mind um, Genesis and, and groups like that as well. And I found myself writing this song about a kid's TV show, a British kid's TV show. And I, I thought, well, this is very enchanting, but what, what the hell are you going to do with that? <laughs> but the, the, the upshot of it was I decided to write an album, um, a prog album, just for me, for my own benefit, and for no, with no one else in mind. Although eventually I did play it to a couple of people and they said, you know, you, 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 know, you must do something with this. And that's when, after a few uh, false starts, I got involved with Rob, Rob Reed, of course. And that's when Cocoon, the album, came out. And if I ever had to choose a, a career decision as to, you know, what can I do with my floundering 
dying career, I don't think I would have said to myself, let's write a prog album, which wouldn't have, it wouldn't have occurred to me to do it. But that's how it happened, you know, and since then, uh, only a year after Cocoon came out, I think I got the approach from, from Andy from Camel. Uh, so I joined those guys, um, which was just uh, unbelievable to this day, really, mm -hmm. and in a good in a good way, and and various other things, working with Magenta and um, and then Red Bazaar, forming Red Bazaar, and the albums, and here we are on the seventh album, and I'm still this is I think this is the longest I've ever been devoted to one particular idea of doing you know, doing prog. Uh, so it seems like I found something that works for me, and, and uh, thankfully and, and very gratifyingly, it seems to work for for the Mothingtons as well. So um, yeah, I, I feel very lucky about it all, and I still think I still find myself thinking, how, you know, what exactly? How do we get here? You know, <laughs> it's um, it's it's a good place to be. Oh boy, absolutely! I, it's such a fascinating uh, evolution, really, and and you're not the first I've heard that from that uh, you know tries to make it in a, in a different genre, gets burnt mm -hmm. out, and kind of goes back to a, an old love in in this case, prog rock, and has surprising success. And there, wow, there's this whole community, and, and now there's these Mothingtons, as you refer to them too. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I mean you know, prog was always in my life, and I, and I think I you know when I was younger, I did dabble in prog. I, I have these tapes which nobody will ever hear, where <laughs> I, I am um, sort of playing and singing, you know, in, in my very high voice, and you know, just doing these improvised uh, the, these uh, freeform compositions and telling stories through song. And I think that was, you know, that was something I enjoyed doing even then. And I kind of stopped doing it when I was a teenager. It just seemed, you know, either not cool or not something that was going to get me very far in the industry. So, so yeah, it definitely is going back to um, something and discovering it new and um, being able to make something new out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, with the, um, with the Tiger Moth Tales, I mean, one thing you haven't really mentioned is just how, uh, proficient and brilliant you are on so many instruments. I, I, I fails to even think of another person who uh, can handle all of the instruments that you handle. I mean, Tiger Moth Tales is all you, isn't it? I mean, all the vocals, the guitars, the keyboards, the wind instruments, even the bass and the drum kit, right? Yeah, you are, well, yes. I mean, there's a lot of one manners out there, I think. Uh, but, um, but uh yeah i i play um make mostly keyboards guitar and sax and obviously when you play keyboards you can you can do well technically anything to, to some degree so yeah I, the drums are all done on the keyboard as is as is the bass it's no it's no secret uh but uh, you know it's the way i grew up doing things so but yeah i mean i i i enjoy being in the studio alone i must say again probably just because it's all that's the way it's always been um, so I, I do perhaps come across as a bit of a control freak there because I want everything to be done just so. But I think it has its, it has its um, advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's start looking at this fine new album here. Just uh, oh, we're almost there to spring. Not not quite yet, but but a song of spring will certainly get us in the right frame of mind and. Um, and and so this is the second in your series, perhaps, of seasons, yes? Yeah. Um, as, as you know, well, you probably know, I had the Storyteller uh, albums, which there is a, there's been two parts of. Um, and, um, yeah, I, start, I did the Depths of Winter back in 2017, and I think I always had the idea that I would do... The, this, the rest of the seasons, or at least it was an idea to have in your back pocket, so to speak, if you know if you were struggling for something else to do. Mm -hmm. And um, this year, or well, sorry, last year, because it was it was mostly it was all done last year. Um, it just felt right to have a go at the spring. It, it felt like we've been in a, a dark time, one way or another, and whichever way you slice it. And uh, maybe by some sort of wishful thinking, it's about time we got, <laughs> time we got out of it into the, into the light. So, so yeah, that was uh, the sort of the impetus to to do uh, the spring album last year. I, I had I, I've said this before. I, I've always got uh, three or four albums in the back of my mind that I could do, 
you know that they there are ideas and and uh, themes going around mm -hmm. and it just depends it depends which one gets there first really. so <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a race. <laughs> I, I, I race my children. Yes. <laughs> yes, the the mad March Hare and the tortoise race, I guess, huh? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so, so we've got a lot of uh, a lot of great stories, really, on on this album, which is no surprise coming from you. And um, well, let's start off talking maybe about this uh, "Dance Till Death" song. Really intriguing one. You start off with. A nice classical guitar intro as uh as if mr hackett has joined us and <laughs> and then we go into the you know this this really intense uh, theme of sacrifice it sounds like yeah it's based on the stravinsky rite of spring which i don't actually know that well musically i mean i've heard it a couple of times it's not you know it, it, it is a very intense piece um and i wanted to have different emotions on the album as I, as I always do and of course spring is the temptation of spring is to you know the, the joys of spring and isn't everything isn't everything lovely and uh, you know <laughs> and I thought well hold on a minute we you know we want some uh, some balance here uh, so the, so it's about the rite of spring which is the, the uh, I believe it's pagan don't don't shoot me if it, if it's not I think it is um sacrifice of the where, where the, the girls are chosen and they have to um, play these kind of games and they they get sort of knocked, you know, uh, worked into, you know, into this, these circles and they dance around and eventually it, it gets whittled down to one girl who then has to dance literally until she dies, is my understanding of it. And um, and I thought, well, that's, that's dark enough. So uh, this is, yeah, this is my take on... Um, the rite of spring and without listening to it too much i didn't want to be sort of too influenced by the music i wanted to do my own thing with it and i think um perhaps i've been listening to too much uh, sorry perhaps i've been working should i say with red bazaar <laughs> for too long because uh, a lot of our songs about uh, about death and um, various uh um terrible concepts and uh, yeah i think it's rubbed off on me a little bit so um i really wanted to get this sort of dark uh, oppressive thing you know that, that just goes on throughout the track eventually building up into the frantic dance itself mm. and even to the point i thought well, let's go let's go darker on this i i have no idea what what the uh, protocol would be for this sacrifice back in you know the the dim and distant past but i thought well let's have it like it's an arena you know like the old roman games and there's literally a crowd chanting dance till death mm. <laughs> I thought that's yeah, that's pretty that's pretty dark, isn't it? So um, so yeah, I did sort of a bit of um, experimental work on that to try and get that effect of all these people um, screaming screaming for the death of a you know a young girl. So uh, yeah, um, well that's 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 cheered things up a bit, isn't it? That yeah, maybe, maybe the wrong note to start on, give people the wrong impression. Maybe, of the whole album, we, we, but... we can only we can only uh, ascend from here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you do, right? With the uh, with the next track, you know, you've got the um, Indian ritual of of Holly there, and uh, really a lot of new uh, flavors on this one. I, I guess a lot of that keyboard generated. Holy, um, yeah. It's now this is where I introduce the um, the hidden stars of the album, which is John Holden. Are you you're familiar with John Holden? I am. Yes. Yeah, John and his wife Elizabeth. Uh, they helped me. Um, they stepped in because basically I, I had written all of the music for the album and um, I was at a lyrical standstill. I'd written, I think, one song lyrically and I was stuck. And I just happened to mention to John off, offhand, you know, I, I'm, I want to, I'm trying to crack on with this album, but I'm, <laughs> I don't know what to write. Um, or I can't, you know, I can't get off the uh, springboard. Um, so he um, he said, well, you know, if you want, you send us a couple of them and we'll see what we can do. So, yeah, John and Elizabeth have provided lyrics for four tracks on this album. And um, but but Holy was actually pretty much John's work. He uh, we were talking about different stories from different cultures. Obviously, we have the, you know, the, the Russian pagan right thing and we have the. Um, 
uh, the, the different, obviously, stories from different countries. And he said, well, you know, I, I'm really fascinated by this uh, Hindu uh, festival of spring, this holy, where they dance around and sort of throw coloured coloured dye at each other and generally have a good old time to welcome in the uh, the spring. So I said, well, you know, if you want to have a go at it, just, you know, because at that by that point I was fairly... I thought we've got we've got enough for the album. I think we've got enough. But if if you want to have a go at something and and show it to me, then you know, fantastic. Because everything John does is uh, is marvelous in in some way or other. So um, yeah, he did this uh, this instrumental track and sent it back. And I was like, wow, it, it sounds absolutely amazing. So <laughs> so yeah, this is, this is pretty much all John's work. Uh, he he wrote some lyrics as well, just to like a um, uh, mantra sort of thing. And I, I performed, I sang the lyrics. But, uh, yeah, that's pretty much John's work, but it's a, it's a really great track. And, um, obviously, yeah, most all done with uh, plugins and samples and stuff. So it's um, just one of the great uh, things you can do these days. And it, um, I think it adds another, another flavour to the album. And, of course, uh, for those who know my previous stuff, I am a, a big fan of Indian music, and I explored that a little myself on um, some earlier Tiger Moth Tales tracks. So... So yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a dimension that I approve of. Yeah, I, I love Indian music too. So I was mm-hmm. thrilled to have that on there too. I think you, mm-hmm. you really hit it. Um, so so then for a song, <laughs> like, yeah, 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 thank you, John. So then for a song like "The Goddess and the Green Man," which Elizabeth wrote the lyrics to, had you already written the music and the melody for that? Yes. Uh, again, it was just another short one. I. I wanted to have a few of these shorter ones to sort of space space out the the epics and also I thought it would allow for more uh you know, diversity of um of the subject matter of the songs so yeah I had this little nice little tune I I often think that I I'm quite good at coming up with nice tunes uh but the lyrics are less fluid um so yeah Elizabeth took this song about um the the goddess of the earth and the the holy king and uh, obviously the Holly King defeats the Oak King. Oh, no, wait, that's the wrong way around. The Oak King defeats the Holly King every spring. That's right. Uh, and um, then the, the, the goddess and the, the um, Oak King get together and the, the union of the earth and the sky. So, yeah, she wrote that lyric. And, uh, and it just it, again, it fitted beautifully. Um, it was right there with what I was sort of the kind of feeling I had in mind. So... Yeah, that's that's a lovely one. A short, short but sweet. Mm-hmm. Indeed, indeed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then we go into this uh, crazy intro for uh, Rapa Nui, the Easter Island song, and I, I still can't figure out what the time signature is on on that intro. <laughs> it's um, it's nine, then eight, then nine, then eight, then nine, then eight, then nine. Uh, oh, yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so that i mean yeah uh that's a nice little um thing to try and get your head around um if, for the uh for those who like that kind of thing and uh, yeah and uh, another of john's tunes or, or john's lyrics should i say one of his themes which is about the uh, the the discovery um of easter isle by the uh the dutch crew who who sailed off in uh, search of discovery and all the rest of it, and their sort of the reactions to the to the Moe, uh, Moai, the the uh, the standing stones, and the people who lived there, and what they what they saw to be a, a doomed exile, because the you know things were sort of deteriorating on the island, living conditions were you know very difficult, the, the weather and the, the climate. And uh, so, yeah, it was the, the, the journey, the story of that voyage. And again, I'd written all the music. So <laughs> uh, I, th- I thought to John, you know, good luck coming up with something for this one, because it, because it is quite, you know, obviously you've got the time signature, but then you've got the, the bit in the middle, which is almost um, like a film score. You could imagine it being in, you know, like a, some sort of, you know, climactic moment or some kind of, a uh, very strange scene in a film. Yeah. So it had that in it. So you had to incorporate that into it to, to mean something. And obviously it was just the, the, the awe and the beauty of the, of the Moai and um, the, and the terrible weather conditions that were on the, uh, on the voyage. So yeah, it's a very atmospheric piece. Uh, great. Again, another great lyric by John here. He, he has, seems to have a habit. He knows where I want 
um, sort of certain stresses to be on on the vocal line, and um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think it's you know it's it's a monster. I I, pers- I think that's you know one of the highlights of of the album, and um, yeah, hopefully people will like it as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another highlight for me is the uh, second track, Forester. Just a, a, <laughs> a gorgeous piece. You know, when when you hit into that uh, line and and there'll be such joy, and then you stretch out that joy with the harmonies. And, wow, I just that's just such a transcendent moment. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that, that that is a track that, um, if I'm being totally honest, has little of or little enough to do with spring. It's uh, based on a, a character from a, a story, a, a book, a book that my wife really likes. Uh, well, I do as well. It's a book called The Tree of Seasons by Stephen Gately, who was a member of Boyzone. If I don't know, if, did you get Boyzone in America? I'm not sure. I didn't, at least. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, well, they were a boy band in the 90s and the the guy wrote this story. It's a great children's story and um, my wife's a massive fan. So, uh, um, And it was a character that I enjoyed from that story and it, it, it probably could have and perhaps ought to have ended up on a storyteller's um, if, there were, if there was going to be a part three in the pipeline. But as there wasn't, and <laughs> this song had been sort of this idea had been going around my head for this is that this is the first one I wrote actually. This is the one I had definitely had an idea as to what the lyric would be, along with Spring Fever. They were sort of the, the two I was definite upon. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's again. I think it's a nice um, little prog uh, showcase, you know. And it has that there's very nice simple acoustic moments in with the guitars and the recorders and the harps and stuff. And then it has the full on uh, battle scene, which is. You know, it really floats the boat of, well, it, I like it, and I think it's something that will appeal to other people. And, it, and it's, an, an, a good, it's a good old honest-to-goodness song of, of good and evil and the, the triumph of good over evil, basically. Yeah, indeed, yeah. Then we get into the, you know, more saxophone and really fun uh, approach of the Mad March Hare. Uh, well, this is, this is your typical um, Tiger Moth Tales fair, really, and... Um, uh, that was, I think, Mad March Hare was one of my wife's ideas to to do a song about, and I think John and Elizabeth actually had a go at that one for me. But in the end, I I, I sort of uh, went back to the drawing board and did it myself because I thought, no, I want the, I want this to be, um, it, it'll be the track, the the love hate track. There's always one, you know, <laughs> or at least there's always one. Um, hopefully, this is a, a little a little less, you know, absurd than you a kid's tale or that kind of thing but it's the, it's that kind of vein which i i never like to do an album without it because i think obviously humor is important i think it's very important in prog and it's sadly lacking in in some <laughs> in some prog um so it's yeah that's something i like to do and it just uh, gives me a chance to show off that side of uh, my um my character i suppose mm-hmm. and yeah it's just a well hopefully it's a really just joyful joyful song yeah, yeah. Um, there may be a metaphor in there for, um, you know, for um, uh, well, well, just the joy of spring in general, and what, what's that thing about the spring turns a young man's fancy, or or that kind of mm-hmm. that kind of thing. But uh, really, it's just about a March Hare and a, a very silly song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get to bring in your uh, camel bandmate Andy at, at the uh, on the last track, Light. Yes, um, th- this one was, uh, I mean, it was a fantastic honor that Andy was up for doing that. He, he'd, he'd, um, we mentioned him perhaps doing a solo on one of my tracks before, but it never, it never came off. I think even as far back as Storytellers 2, mm-hmm. I think we were talking about it. And I think um, sometimes I, I get far too involved in the process and, and, it, and I just sort of, I speed along and, and uh, you know, get past the point where I sort of where I can accept things differently to how I already planned them, if that makes sense. And and Andy gets that because he's very much he's very much the same. Um, so yeah, it didn't it didn't work out for one reason or another. Um, but um, with this track, I I left him room to do what he would like to do, and uh, and amazingly, he uh, agreed to do it. And light is. Um, 
again, it's a song about is deal, dealing with loss. The, 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 there always seems to be one or two tracks about that on my albums these days. And of course, the, the, the older you get, the more loss you deal with, um, which is a, another cheerful comment. But yeah, so it was, I didn't know what it was going to be about at the time. I'd just done the music, as I say. Um, and I said, I want this to be really uh, poignant, very sort of emotional, kind of sad, but but also sort of building with hope towards the end, you know, a kind of a, a turnaround. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have, the only lyrics I had was the chorus, which is, um, you know, um, uh, now the winter has gone and springtime has come, giving us light, giving us new light, uh, new life again. So that was basically my thing. Um, you know, it's another celebration song of spring and trying to leave the darkness of the winter behind and embrace the, the spring. So I think John and Elizabeth sort of tackled this one together and they came up with the idea of a, um, you know, somebody losing their partner or their, their wife, their husband or whatever, um, losing their loved one in the winter and obviously being totally devastated and then trying to, you know, pull their lives together, trying to work out a way of moving on and, and spring being having some kind of healing power in that and em embracing uh, life, not just uh, of the new life of the season, but trying to build a new life for yourself. And, um, and I, I read these lyrics along with what I'd written and I thought, God, yes, that, that works. It, it, straight away, well, we had to make a couple of alterations and then we had to work on the, the bridge a little, but it, it came together really well. And then when Andy put his um, solo on the top, I just thought, yep, there we go. It's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, a great way to end the album. And well, you know, obviously you can't predict these things. I, I would like to think it will turn into a, an, a, a bit of an anthem, a bit of a crowd favorite. Mm -hmm. And the, and uh, you know, hopefully that will be the case. But it's it's up to the listener, of course. But I, I'm very, very pleased with how it came out, and we're very thankful to Andy and um, John and Elizabeth. So, yeah, um, a winner. <laughs> Absolutely. But wait, there's more. There's oh. a bonus track. Yes. Oh, you, oh, you found it. Yeah, it's called called <laughs> Maytime, and you know, I really wondered what you were what your goal was in, in the song. It's got a very different feel. You know, we've almost got this contemporary jazz feel, sometimes uh, going into fusion. And um, so it's just got a very different sense than the rest of the album. And I was wondering, is, is there a wooden flute solo on there? Uh, yeah, well, Maytime is, um, it, well, it's an old hymn. Um, I don't know, I think it's a British hymn. Hmm. We we used to sing it in school, and the, the tune is uh, May time, May time, God has given the May time. Da, 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 da. It's, it's actually it's the same tune, uh, but of course it's a very different feeling on the, on the original. It's a, like a traditional sort of folk hymn, and uh, well, well, a kids hymn, I think actually. And I did this one, I think, fairly early on in the in the process, and. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I've always wanted to have a crack at that kind of jazz fusion-y sort of stuff, which I, I mean, I've dabbled it in the past with it. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a take, it's a jazz fusion take on a sort of early 20th century hymn. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of progressive, I guess. And <laughs> uh, yeah, I used the saxophone on it um, and I used my penny whistles. I have a, a few different penny whistles in different pitches and they do they're, they're kind of long you know quite long whistles and they're deep mm -hmm. um so they do have that um flute flute sound to them so and i have to i have to employ a bit of uh wizardry there because they're in fixed keys but um i, I won't go into the to that too much to spoil the illusion but so uh, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a irish type low whistle and it, it appears um you obviously you you've had the um the downloadable version mm -hmm. and i yeah it it, it uh, i don't i don't know how to tell you this really because it it, it, it might spoil the surprise but yeah, on the c on the cd it um is basically it is a bonus track that you find if you if you leave it going for long enough it'll come on ah, it's, it's a bit of old school yeah. <laughs> uh, it's it's just there but but yeah, I wasn't, uh, you know, we, we weren't quite sure about it. There was, um, you know, we weren't quite sure if it sort of fitted with the rest of the album, but I was quite 
keen on having it on there. So we thought, well, let's let's have a good old bonus track and put it on there. And and again, you know, it depends which way you want to end the album. You can either end it end it with light, which is one feeling of, you know, sort of hope from sadness and you know, trying to sort of move on and, and obviously that's a feeling that we can all relate to and trying to take strength mm-hmm. um in, in a in a difficult situation. Or you can end it with May time, which is just oh let's go crazy and uh, <laughs> have a good time. So <laughs> so the, the the choice is yours. <laughs> so I'm I'm always uh fascinated. I obviously I haven't seen you perform live, but um you know, seen some video clips and sometimes of you playing, you know, keyboards with one hand and guitar with another hand, lead guitar. And, and I'm thinking, it, I mean, that just seems impossible for, for anyone to do. And then when you have the, the actual uh, quality of vision gone from you, um, that you're able to do that even more so. And then I started wondering, well, maybe that's even a, a benefit in some way. Do, do you think that not having the, the sense of sight actually has made yeah, you... Yeah, well, I mean, you know, they, they, they say men can't multitask, don't they? And I... I, I, I... <laughs> oh, I lost you again. Oh, yep, still here. Oh. oh, I think I got where you were going with that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the... the 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 sight thing um it's it's uh something i've often wondered about but it's really impossible to say really because i went blind so young Mm -hmm. so i you know i don't know any any better um but uh, you know it's not too much of a stretch to to say that you know i I probably latched on to music and and therefore i've sort of taken to it in, in a big way and I think you know it's, it's possible that it may it may have provided some advantages um, in in some way. I think uh, that there's advantages to every situation if you can if you can find them. Um, and I you know as to the playing three instruments or singing singing at the same time, I said they, they say men can't multitask, and I say well you know watch this. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, it's it's a it's a bit of a. It's something that evolved actually when I was at school because we had um, um, well a bit later than school actually we we had a band a three piece band and uh, the, it was me on guitar and there was a drummer and a bassist and the bassist uh, without warning moved moved to Scotland mm. so it, <laughs> it left us um, he left us high and dry and um, in the end I got some bass pedals and then I thought well can we have the guitar as well uh, and then I ended up having the keyboard underneath and um, started out very badly but eventually managed to get some sort of technique of playing them both at the, at the same time but it's something that I use sparingly nowadays because I think um, well a it can it can detract from your from the vocal sometimes and um, well, and, and also I'm not as young as I was, you know. I'm not not as uh, not, not as sharp as I once was. So, so I, I just leave it for the uh, the, the, the special occasions. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> very impressive for sure. I, I the only thing I've dabbled with like that is I uh, I play didgeridoo as well as guitar, and so I would set up a, a stand to hold the didgeridoo so I could play that at the same time as the guitar, and that was well. Well, that was fun well that's one. That's one instrument that I can I cannot play. So. So there you are. You've uh, you, you've trumped me on that one. Ah, oh, you've been really done it, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> I've, well, I've, no, I did try. I tried a couple of times, but I I can't play flute either. Um, I I can't play trumpets or anything brass, and I can't bow anything. So uh, so uh, I do have my limits. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's uh, just so much promising music that you're involved with. You know, different bands that you're involved with. I, and I hear. Um, Camel's going to be touring later again this year. Is there, um, do you have a focus for you on what your priorities are in the coming years? Um, hold on uh, for, for grim debt, uh, you know, and uh, hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I, 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 I do sometimes have to sort of pull myself up and think, hold, hold on a minute, you know, we need to sort of get you, work out what you're doing here, get your priorities sorted out. I mean, Tiger Moth Tales is, is you know, I think uh, unavoidably, I think is the, the thing that I prioritise. Um, but 
but it, but you know you can only you can only be working on one album. Well, as you could work on several albums at a time, but you know once you've got, you know you, it's it's good to have the variety um, to move on to the next thing. So I mean, for instance, Red Bazaar's new album will be coming out, and sometime this year I, I would ha I hazard a guess and say May or June. Huh. Uh, it's taking a bit taking a bit longer than we than we thought. So there's new Red Bazaar material. Um, I can't say too much about it, but I know Rob wants to um, to progress with the cyan stuff. So, uh, you know, we we may have new cyan content uh, to be working on, and um, that's very exciting. And then, of course, there's the Camel Tour, which is next year. So that's a lot. That's a way off yet. Uh, next year. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I, I probably you know I, I feel that I should you know give Tiger Moth Tales the um, you know the priority sort of thing but uh but there's there's time there's time for other things it just means you have to sometimes sit step back a bit and take stock and uh <laughs> try and um try and get a schedule on it so which is which is tricky for me but um you know i've had a lot of fun collaborating with other artists and um and you know most of the time i haven't torn my hair out too much trying to keep up with it also so <laughs> good good times Excellent. Well, Pete, thanks so much for the fantastic music and for the chat today. And uh, really hoping that people who are listening to this, I'm, I'm sure by now, they uh, are just really getting into the new album. So um, look forward to talking with you again with whatever comes in the future. Well, thank you so much. It's been great to talk to you. And uh, yeah, no, thanks a lot. All right. Thanks, Pete. Springtime has come Giving up